So we're now at Carrow Moor megalithic complex. Some of the stones here date back to 5400 BC. So I'm very inspired and intrigued uh, by coming to visit this site in County Sligo. Uh, we're going to go and check out the visitor centre, see if there's anything of interest in there uh, before we head into the main site. And then we're going to have a look around these incredible cans and there's stone circles here as well. And then we're going to go and check out Carrow Keel, which is high up on the hills, on a mountain top. So let's see what they've got for us in here. This is, this is it's a um, topographical depiction of the whole of the Kulira Peninsula. And um, the, um, the way to recognize it is you have Sligo Town here. This is Caramore. I could tell it was. You have Norton Array. And that's where we Over saw the there. mountain on top of. Correct, yeah. Down here you have the Ox Mountains, and then you have a series of hills surrounding it all the way. And the idea is that Caramore is the epicentre um, of the burial practices. The very top of all of these hills... These have, little silver dots the, are These little silver buried. dots are all burials, yeah. And they venerate this area here, so this really is the focal point um, for the burial practices on the whole of the Kulira Peninsula. If you were to walk up Nochnaray, what you'd find is, as well as having um, what they class as Maid's Cairn, the big one in the middle, you've also got um, some more cairns that sit in a curve, which look in to this area um, of Caramore. And it's, it's all about veneration from the inside looking out, but also on the outside looking in. So you could class this as being in the centre of, of a huge, huge amphitheatre. All of these burials, when you look at them, or they, these cairns, they all sit bang on the skyline. So it doesn't matter where you are, when you look at the top of the hill, you do see this, on the, on the, you see this profile of the burials on the very, very top. The, the ultra-specific, where they located these, um, these cairns on uh, the edge of the peninsula, sitting bang on the skyline. As the guide will be explaining, these are the first recognised ritual burial practices to have had in Ireland. Mm. Six thousand, six and a half thousand years ago. Mm. Well, isn't it 5,400 BC is the oldest one? 5,463. Nothing specific. Within a thousand years or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what is really uh, intriguing is these are the earliest ones that we know about, but these took place maybe uh, 2,000, 2,500 years after the last Ice Age uh, retreated. So we've no idea what was here before. Just behind me is one of the very small dolmens at Carrowmore. Uh, it faces towards the giant can in the centre, which was actually called the Giant's Grave. And it's also made of nice rock, even though it's within a limestone plateau. And all the stone came from the mountains to the south over there, past the main can. So it's interesting that there's two types of rock here, the gneiss, which is crystalline, and then the limestone, which is more chalky. So there's two different types of rock, and we know that this kind of gneiss rock was also used at different sites, even in the Boyne Valley as well. So there may be something there that links with the, the way they were working with the energy of these sites. So here's that small dolmen, and you can just see in the background the way the main can is kind of part of that up on the southern hills around Caramore, you can see the mountains in the background with cairns on top there's a legend that says a witch lived up there and when she flew over Caramore, she dropped all the stones from her apron and they fell upon the whole complex and created the cairns and the stone circles just like we see at Love Crew we see the same legend with the witch and the apron and the dropping of the stones um, so the state, you can see where the state owns the property, there are no stone walls left. Why? Because after the excavations they just put them back up here. But they left this area open so that we could go into the chamber and have a look. Mm. But as I say, at some point this was a buried chamber. Mm. 
Um, so it was quite a shock a few years ago to discover that it had a very precise orientation. Okay, and it comes right from the mountains over there. Um, to your right hand, you'll see a, a telegraph pole. You see that? Yep. Uh, look to the left of the telegraph pole, and you'll see a very, very, um, very much a, a saddle shape in the mountains there. Can you see it? Yep. And if you look into that saddle at either side, you'll see two points. One on either side. The point on the left is actually the side of a cliff that you're looking at, and the point on the right is just a little hill. Uh, both natural features, I might add. But every year the sun rises directly between those two, <laughs> and it lights up the central chamber. Um, what date? Okay. <laughs> this is the biggest shop. <laughs> wow. what, what time of year is that? Yeah, yeah, the 31st it. of October and the 1st of November. Oh, that's uh, no consequence. Uh, absolutely no consequence. <laughs> absolutely not. But it gets better. Well, because the sun rises further and further south as the winter progresses here. It passes all of those passage tombs. By the way, the Ballygoli Mountains, by a lot of local people, is known as the body of the Kalya, the yeah. witch. Okay? But it gets to her house finally, near her house, it's not exactly on it. And that's midwinter. That's as far as it goes. And then it starts to progress back again. And it eventually is smack between those two points again on the 9th and 10th of February. No. Hmm. Scarily close to the Festival of Inbuk. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, you can imagine how blown away we were, you know, mm -hmm. um, just to witness what was happening because it's such a powerful event. And I'll explain it yeah. when we get into the chamber itself. But um, the biggest shock, of course, was when we went to celebrate in the pub that night. Yeah. And over the bar <laughs> was this gorgeous thing, a witch flying on her broomstick. <laughs> it's Halloween, lads! <laughs> and a few weeks later, the old story came back to bite us. Mm. The Kalyuk flying over the peninsula on her broomstick. We're still celebrating her today. Mm. Now, you might think that's very wild. It's absolute <laughs> fact. But we have done some research. <coughs> and in the Basque country, they have a witch on her broomstick. Oh. Uh, in Galicia, in Spain, they have a witch on her broomstick. She has different names. She's the Moros. She's different. But she's always on her broomstick and she always drops the stones out of her apron, just like wow. Loch mm -hmm. It's the same story and it's connected with the megaliths. Mm -hmm. Now, who's the Kalyuk? Who's the witch? Yeah. Well, as time goes on, you begin to realise this is a very pivotal time of year. I've already said that to you when we were on our way up here. This is a very scary time of year, okay, for people. They're heading into winter. It's the last big gathering of the year. So it became the first gathering of the year in our past, okay? It was the time when the king was inaugurated. It became the gathering time at Tara. Tara, you had to be at Tara. The king had to be in Tara for Samhain, okay? There is one other passage to him aligned to the same sunrise. It doesn't have that feature, but it is the Mount of the Hostages in Tara. Mm. That's why the king had to be there. He had to see the sun shining and light the bones of his ancestors. Okay, um, think back. We're looking at Knocknarray over here. Okay, now you'll see a beautiful stone here. And anyone who's ever done any medieval writings on Irish inauguration sites will know that there was some very strange happenings at uh, inaugurations of kings in Ireland. Because one of them was, um, and I think it was Geraldus Comprensis actually wrote about it, where it was the oddest thing ever, but the, the king had to take off his sandal and it had to be handed to his tarnishta. Okay, and then he put his stone, his foot on the on a stone. Mm. Mm. Okay, mm. and we do know there's been a lot of work done now. This officially is called a petrosomatoglyph, <laughs> just to make it academic sound. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's the little one. This is the main one. Look at it here. Yeah. Um, the um, these are always found associated now with with in ancient inauguration sites. Okay. Mm. Now, uh, whether Caramore, we have no writings to tell us or suggest that this was used as an inauguration site, but that kind of speaks for itself. Mm. Okay, and we do know, as we followed on in the tradition, that inauguration happened at these sites as we go further across. But back to what's actually happening within the landscape around us here. Okay, the Kalyuk is m more than probably a representation of the Earth in winter. Mother Nature, we still call her Mother Nature or Mother Earth, mm -hmm. you know. It's our relationship with the world around us. And of course, 
at the end of October, the beginning of November, that's when the trees have lost their leaves. They're all old and wizened and the ground around us has just retracted. Okay, And it goes into another zone, out of our line of sight. We don't know what's going on. Um, but this is the time for belief. This is the time for faith. And so people imagine that um, in a world without any kind of science, that you have to believe and eventually things will turn around. So inside the main can at Carrow Moor, this is supposedly called the giant's grave. It aligns facing outwards to the mountains with Sam Hain and across the mountain tops, it kind of links with all the different times of the year with the sun rises uh, throughout the times of the year. So it's like a real major astronomical temple, potentially going back to 5,400 BC. Inside the main can behind me is the main dolmen where the whole can and the earth and the stone were built over. So you can just see that the extreme ancientness of this site is fortunately being preserved just because it's so uh, far away from the main uh, cities of Ireland. So this really is one of the most impressive uh, cans I've seen in the whole of Ireland. You can see this dolmen behind me. Uh, this is made from gneiss, which is a rock that comes from the southern mountains. Uh, it's crystalline rock and it's got paramagnetic qualities. Whereas the mountains is actually the hills it's built on, it's actually limestone. Um, this was inside the middle of the can and you can see all the stones that make up the can have been put back with metal um, fencing now. When the sun has risen, just up, this stone comes into play. Okay, do you see the shape of it? Yeah. It starts to cast a shadow. So as the, the, as the V of light, the spear of light is going down, the back stone, a spear of black is coming up and meeting oh. it and passing it. Wow. Something. Honestly, wow. it is quite incredible to see. Stunning. From this stone? From yeah. it, well, it's cast from, from this, this stone. stone. Yes. Yeah. Because the sun has risen up and so that's creating that shape wow. and you have this spear of black coming this way as the spear of light is going down that way wow. it's, it's something else it really yeah, is something else wow. now we have no idea what's going on oh, yeah. originally on this side because you see nobody knew about this until quite recently and so this side is obscuring this part oh. of the the chamber. Sun. So maybe there was two V's of light and one V of black coming up. We don't know. So they need to actually take some of this down. Well, you try and get the OPW. <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> That's not going to happen soon, I can tell you that much. No. But uh, no, saying that, the minister in charge of the OPW, he's been here a few times recently. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And he reckons he's going to be here for the 31st of October if he can at all. Then you but, make um, it inspired. Too. Exactly. <laughs> well, he's already, and his wife is really inspired, which means he'll be inspired. Uh -huh. yeah. um, but. Um, it's quite something to witness this happening. Wow. It really is. Um, mm. But you know what it does as well? It makes you realize how very, very carefully engineered this monument is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore the others are too. Mm -hmm. We should never, never, never take a dolmen or a megalith for granted. Mm -hmm. We should yeah. always look at the precision. Mm. So with all of this hill gone, I'm a little confused. No, the, 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 this mound was about to hear. Okay. In actual fact, when we get back down to the centre, if anyone wants to see what it looked like before the excavations, mm -hmm. I can show you. So people were looking at the landscape first. Mm -hmm. These were additions. Yeah. They were human additions to the landscape. Yeah. But that's why we can never take these for granted anymore. Mm -hmm. We should always be looking at their direction. We should always, always be looking at how they were constructed to the original ground level around them, because that's the human story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And... and, and uh, Archaeologists have often said in the past they've seen these structures as purely to do with the dead, but as you've said, it's to do with life and life rebirth and them. celebration yeah. as well. Cycle. So they're life they're people made them, not dead people. Exactly. You know? And so that that's telling us the belief systems. But now that we've got a handle on the whole idea of Halloween and Samhain, who knows where it'll finish? Yeah. You know. But the one thing that's stunningly clear is we haven't changed all that much in six thousand yeah. years. Mm -hmm. You know. So this has remained at this same angle. Uh, as she was suggesting, to have that light effect uh, on the underneath of it, it would have had to have been a very yeah. stable structure. That's what I was thinking. Ooh, some Irish sunshine coming in. more Irish sunshine. This was a well-known site to study the different times and movements of the solar year. Seven bodies were also found in here um, that seemed to have the flesh kind of 
cut off the bones. Some people say it's a sacrifice, others say it may be a kind of re reverence to the people, to the high kings of this area. And so this is an incredible site, it's a very sacred space. And, um, and they've cemented the stones in, uh, interestingly, because uh, these are just standing, these aren't buried. And so when the archaeologists first turned out, they did the right thing and they put everything in place. And even you have these little stones here just to maintain the exact angle of the, of the capstone and the other stones within it. To, so it creates that particular effect. So it's an incredible site. It's precision engineered from 4000 BC. Visiting these sacred sites, uh, Every site is animated uh, with several things, one of which is powerful currents of earth energy. And we've talked about this a little bit and done a little bit of dowsing. Um, but I, I think uh, in relation to where we went this morning, I wanted to amplify on this because um, the, the stones in these structures are, are really important. Uh, and our guide Jean this morning mentioned the type of stone uh, that was there at Caramore. Uh, she said it's nice, spelled G N E I S S, yep. and nice, it's a sedimentary rock that has, she said, was a, had a, uh, a metamorphic rock, sorry, uh, that has quartz in it. We saw it, they were talking at Newgrange about the, the sun hitting hitting the quartz. So these stones not only draw up the earth energy, but they draw down the solar uh, power as well. So they are uniting the sun and the earth, if you like, the, uh, the, the, the masculine, the feminine, uh, in this wonderful uh, alchemical marriage. And so, when we go into a circle of stones, you know, we are entering, we are entering a temple. We absolutely are. We're entering a place where an energetic and alchemical marriage fusion of cosmic and earth energies are happening. The, if you like, this of the sun god and the earth goddess uniting and there were particularly powerful times of the year when that was more potent. Uh, um, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about the Celtic year um, and there were certain times when the focus was different. You know, the, the real, uh, as, as Jean said this morning, the, the beginning of the Celtic year was actually the start of winter, Samhain in November. Uh, and that was the start of the Celtic year. And so the, you know, the end of that time was more subdued and it was going down, but then as we go through the winter solstice and into uh, the new year through February with in bulk, the end of the light returns. And, and that was time when Bridget was very much associated with in bulk. And Jean, you know, said it so beautifully today, looking from that central cairn over to that saddle in the hills, uh, the sun rising on Samhain for the crone, for the oh. the witch, for, for the uh, 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 for, for the, if you like the hag or the wise woman, and then moving across the other side uh, at Imbolc, rising as Bridey or the maiden or even you know the bride, the virgin bride. Brilliant. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful symbolism which embodies. You know this fabulous wisdom about what's happening physically energetically in the world but carried forward for us through these wonderful stories 